So very good morning to you all. Today we are going to discuss in this session uh, all the important pearls for the endocrinology exams from the Oxford Handbook of Endocrinology and Diabetes 4th edition. Now these contains important charts and tables uh, picked up directly from the Oxford Handbook uh, which are extremely important from the exam perspective and uh, every year several questions come from these uh, charts and tables. Uh, my overall aim will be to cover more and more of these sessions and uh, to provide a quick overview of the Oxford Handbook in terms of all its important charts and tables. Number one chart in this scenario is the uh, chart regarding diabetic retinopathy uh, based on the national screening guidelines of the United Kingdom. And specifically they ask about the timing of referral in context of the different stages of the retinopathy. As you may be knowing that I have a full session on diabetic retinopathy and on this referral criteria and also have classified in detail in that session about the different stages of the retinopathy. Now in this chart from Oxford Handbook, we'll be looking at the reasons for and the timing of referral to ophthalmologist in context of diabetic retinopathy. So immediate referral if the patient has developed rubiosis iridis or neovascular glaucoma vitreous hemorrhage, or if there is an advanced retinopathy with retinal detachment. So in all these three scenarios, we will definitely need for an immediate referral to the ophthalmologist. What about urgent referral less than two weeks? R3 stage of diabetic retinopathy, which is proliferative retinopathy. As untreated high-risk proliferative di diabetic retinopathy carries a 40% risk of blindness in less than two years, and laser treatment considerably reduces this. So if there is an R3 or a proliferative stage of retinopathy, diabetic retinopathy, there should be an urgent referral. This urgent referral is classed as less than two weeks. Immediate referral is above, as I mentioned, for the about three uh, indications. Now come to routine referral, less than 13 weeks, that is R2 or pre-proliferative changes. Even M1 and maculopathy comes in the routine referral, which is less than 13 weeks. Now, of course, in the exam question scenario, you'll be either giving a grading or you'll be giving the different pointers towards the type of stage of the diabetic retinopathy, based on which we can guess the grading and then they'll be asking how soon will the patient need referral. So that's how we will need to do. A routine non-diabetic retinopathy referral will be needed in cases of cataracts. Uh, other categories, which is R0, which is no retinopathy, annual screening. Then moving to two yearly, if two negative screens. R1, which is background retinopathy, again, annual screening and inform the diabetes care team. So each and every statement of this particular chart is very important. And at least one question to two questions we can expect from this chart in the coming exams. Let's look at the trimester specific minimal cortisol levels to exclude adrenal insufficiency. So this is another important chart. Again, from this chart, there has been a question asked in the previous exams. So in terms of pregnancy, what is the minimal cortisol levels to exclude adrenal insufficiency? What is the baseline cortisol and what is the stimulated cortisol, which is after the short cyanotin test at 30 minutes? So the first trimester cutoff at zero minutes is 300 and 30 minutes is 700. Second trimester is 450, third trimester is 600. Whereas after stimulated, uh, the, after the short cyanotin test, the stimulated cortisol, about 800 in terms of second trimester and about 900 in terms of the third trimester. So these are very important values. And of course, we know in a non-pregnant state, this will be a baseline value of more than 400 as a uh, cutoff to exclude uh, adrenal insufficiency and the stimulated cortisol after 30 minutes, usually more than 450, which excludes adrenal insufficiency. Again, a question has been asked, especially in the for a lady in the second trimester in the previous exams. What about investigations for PO and paraganglioma in terms of uh, sensitivity and specificity? Recurrently asked as questions, uh, uh, for example, plasma metanephrines in terms of the biochemical uh, analysis, 97% sensitive. So that's the most sensitive in terms of the uh, biochemistry. So plasma metanephrines. What about uh, urinary metanephrines? So urinary metanephrines is the most specific for that matter, that is around. 95%. So these are the two important things to remember. Plasma metanephrines, 
ninety sense percent sensitive, so most sensitive, and urinary matter mm -hmm. nephrons ninety five percent specific, so most specific. Okay, then we come to the imaging modalities, especially. So we talk about MRI, the most sensitive ninety eight percent, and most specific is the MIBG scan, which is ninety five percent. So this is very important to note. So MRI is more sensitive than the CT scan in this regards. So CT scan with a sensitivity of 93%. Again, a very important chart from the Oxford Handbook. Now, again, this is a very important chart for clinical practice from the Oxford Handbook again. Now, in terms of uh, thyroid nodules, thyroid cancer in this regards, uh, many a times, you know, in terms of uh, exams as well, they follow the American College of Radiology thyroid imaging pattern, especially for the Tyrex uh, classification for the uh, nodules, for the thyroid nodules. So looking at the uh, different categories, so we have TR1, TR2, TR3, TR4, and TR5. Now, this is the, defined by the number of the points which are added up. So this number of the points will depend upon the composition, the echogenicity, the shape, the margin, and the echogenic foci. So if you go through all of this, there are different points which are attached to each of these categories. Now, when we are classifying, we add up the points from all the categories to determine the tyroids level. So if the points is zero, that is classed as TR1, which is benign, and there is no need for FNC. If the total addition of the points is equal to two points, then it is TR2, that is not suspicious and no need for FNC. If the total points added up are three points, that is TR3, then that is mildly suspicious and FNAD, FNAC is needed if it is more than or equal to 2.5 centimeters in size. And there will be only follow up needed if it is more than or equal to 1.5 centimeters up to 2.5 centimeters. Basically. Then if the point is between 4 to 6, then that becomes moderately suspicious or TR4. FNAC is needed if greater than or equal to 1.5 centimeters, whereas follow up is needed between more than or equal to 1 centimeters up to 1.5 centimeters. Seven points or more, which is TR5, that is highly suspicious nodule. FNAT, FNAC will be needed even if it is more than or equal to one centimeters, whereas between uh, 0.5 to up to one maximum, it will be a uh, follow-up which is required. Again, we should be very careful in this regards uh, uh, that uh, we are taking into consideration all the things like composition, echogenicity, shape, margin, and echogenic foci. So this is a very important tyrides classification. And uh, it's very important to note uh, the uh, classification for the exam perspective. Many questions are asked actually two or three in the exams every time. So I'm just emphasizing more TR3, mildly suspicious, FNAC if more than or equal to 2.5 centimeters, follow up if more than or equal to 1.5 centimeters at one, three, and five years. Again, they've asked this in the previous exam. So at one, three, and five years. When it, there is TR4, the FNAC if it is more than or equal to 1.5 centimeters and follow up if more than or equal to 1 centimeters at 1, 2, 3 and 5 years. Okay, so it becomes more closer follow up. So 1, 2, 3 and 5 years. Whereas if it is more than 7 point, uh, then it is highly suspicious and if follow up is needed, if it is more than or equal to 0.5 centimeters uh, up to 1 centimeters, then we should be monitoring it annually for up to five years. So again, the follow-up becomes more close in this context. Another important chart for evaluation of gynecomastia. Uh, when we are evaluating a gynecomastia, we are looking at especially these five hormonal patterns, HCG, LH, testosterone, estradiol, and TSH. And all the differential diagnosis can then be assessed based on these five hormonal patterns. So there, if there is an increase in the HCG or E2, uh, do a testicular ultrasound. If normal, then look for abdominal or chest imaging. Why? To look for extragonadal, estradiol, or HCG secreting tumors. Of course, if the testicular ultrasound uh, shows a testicular tumor, then that's the diagnosis in this context. If we have an increased LH and testosterone, then that's pointing towards androgen resistance. If there is a decrease LH and decreased testosterone, then this is usually secondary hypogonadism. Usually, you look out for prolactinoma as the cause of uh, secondary hypogonadism. If there is an increase LH and in decrease in the testosterone, that's primary hypogonadism. If there is a decrease in TSH, patient is thyrotoxic, uh, that can also cause gynecomastia. Now, 
another important chart extremely important from exam perspective about the diagnostic features of from the FNAC of a thyroid again in terms of uh, sensitivity and specificity again we should be very very careful to note uh, about the sensitivity and specificity mean values especially in this context uh, diagnostic categories from FNSE extremely important for exam we will expect at least two questions from this particular chart of Oxford handbook in the exam high one non-diagnostic insufficient epithelial cells do an ultrasound reassessment ultrasound assessment plus or minus repeat sampling high one c says fluid with insufficient collide and epithelial cells correlate with clinical and ultrasound findings Thai 2 is non-neoplastic, correlate with clinical and ultrasound findings. Uh, Thai 3A, atypical features present but not enough to place into any other categories. Further ultrasound plus or minus repeat FNS is needed in this category. Discussion at the thyroid cancer MDT may be carried out. If it is a Thai 3F, suspected follicular neoplasm, histological possibilities include a hyperplastic nodule, follicular adenoma or follicular carcinoma. We cannot uh, rule out any of these things or there can be a follicular variant of papillary carcinoma. So that's the best action forward will be a diagnostic hemithyroidectomy with completion thyroidectomy if malignant because there is a 10 to 40 percent risk of malignancy in thigh 3 nodules. Coming to thigh 4, suspicious of malignancy, uh, there can be papillary, medullary or anaplastic carcinoma slash lymphoma. So diagnostic hemithyroidectomy is highly recommended is the action way forward, 70 percent risk of malignancy in this scenario. Thigh 5, which is diagnostic of malignancy, surgical excision for differentiated thyroid cancer, this means a total thyroidectomy because there is a 98% risk of cancer in this scenario. Radio and chemotherapy may be needed for anaplastic thyroid cancers and lymphoma slash metastasis. Extremely important chart again from in context of the men's syndromes. Uh, what is the surveillance schedule and timing of prophylactic thyroidectomy and screening for the pyochromocytoma and primary hyperparathyroidism uh, in the men two scenario? So if it is a red mutation which is high risk as per the American Thyroid Association. So these were the latest guidelines released in 2015. In this context, uh, if it is a MET 918THR, that's a high risk uh, red mutation. In this scenario, we should undertake uh, red uh, genetic testing uh, if at less than one year of age. Uh, age to begin calcitonin ultrasound monitoring uh, less than 0.5 to one year. Age to undertake prophylactic thyroidectomy less than one year. So this is a very high risk if we can classify it as the highest risk met 918 thr age to begin screening for pheochromocytoma 11 years and uh, in this there is a ph uh, pt which is primary hyperparathyroidism is not applicable in terms of the screening what about uh, ata high risk uh, this is codon 634 uh, plus ala 883 phe age to undertake red genetic testing for the mtc should be less than three years Age to begin calcitonin ultrasound monitoring again three years. Age to undertake prophylactic thyroidectomy five years or uh, earlier. Age to begin screening for pheochromocytoma and primary hyperparathyroidism 11 years. If it is an ATA moderate risk, which is all other pathogenic red mutations, not the ones mentioned on the uh, first two, uh, uh, I mean MET 918 and not code on 638 ALA 883, all other pathogenic red mutations, these should be. Uh, undertaken red genetic testing at less than three to five years, age to begin calcitonin ultrasound monitoring five years, age to undertake prophylactic thyroidectomy greater than five years based on ultrasound and calcitonin, age to begin screening from PCC and PHPT 16 years. So a very important chart from Oxford Handbook. Uh, at least expect one to two questions from this chart in the coming exams. What is the recommended activity of radioiodine for different uh, Conditions of thyroid, if it is a Graves disease, first presentation, no significant eye disease, moderate goiter, 400 to 600 MBQ. If it is a toxic multinodular goiter in an older person, uh, 500 to 800. If it is a toxic adenoma, usually uh, 500 is what is recommended. If it is a severe Graves disease with Graves ophthalmopathy, ideally we should postpone REI until eye disease is stable. And if really required needed, then prednisone 40 milligrams will be administered at the same time as radioiodine and a further four weeks after getting the uh, MDQ dose of 500 to 800. Abrasion therapy, severe accompanying medical conditions such as heart failure, atrial fibrillation or other medical disorders should be taken into consideration and that dose is usually between 500 to 800. So in the past, we have been asked for Graves disease, which is 400 to 600 and there have been 
uh, questions asked about toxic MNG as well. In this also, it will be 500 to 800. So several questions have been asked from this particular chart of Oxford in the previous exam. Uh, radiological localization of the pancreatic encelonomas, again, it is, has been asked previously in terms of the imaging investigation. So if you look at the endoscopic ultrasound, that's almost 94%. Intraoperative ultrasound, again, this will be a little bit of an invasive, but it is almost like 100% sensitive in terms of another invasive test, which is a, a arterial stimulated uh, venous sampling. Uh, it is having a 100% sensitivity in terms of localization of the pancreatic in nomas. So endoscopic ultrasound, the highest is intraoperative ultrasound for that matter, and the venous sampling as well. So almost approximating 100% for intraoperative ultrasound, as well as the invasive test of arterial stimulate, uh, calcium stimulated venous sampling. Looking at the suggested uh, frequency of screening for CKD uh, in terms of the different EGFR categories, this is again, has been asked uh, because this is based on the Kidigo guidelines. Uh, this has been asked as uh, questions in the previous exams and you can definitely expect some questions in this exam as well. It depends upon GFR categories and further according to the albuminuria stages, description and range. So if it is G1, A1, where A1 means normal to mildly raised albuminuria, which is less than 30 uh, milligram per gram or less than three milligram per millimole. A2 is moderately increased, which is between 30 to 300, and A3 is severely increased, which is more than 300 milligram per gram, or which is more than 30 milligram per millimole. Now, if along with that, if we have a, a EGFR of a, more than or equal to 90, okay, then in this case, the frequency of monitoring of EGFR, number of times per year is what is mentioned here. Less than or equal to one. If it is A2, then one. And if it is A3, then more than or equal to one. Going down further, if it is between 60 to 89, again, less than or equal to one, one, and more than or equal to one. Then, so if you look at the G1 as well as G2, so whether it is greater than 90 or whether it is between 60 to 89, so up to uh, 60, you can say, this will be the standard frequency of monitoring of EGFR, which is less than or equal to one if it is A1, one if it is A2, and more than or equal to one if it is A3. Now coming further for the down group. so. G3A, which is mild to moderate, which is between 45 to 59, 1, 1, and 2. So this is very important. So two times a year, we'll need monitoring if it is G3A uh, in uh, this context. On the other hand, it is G3B, which is moderate to severe, so 30 to 42. So again, the frequency of monitoring of EGFR will increase less than or equal to 2 if A1, 2 if A2, and more than or equal to 2 if A3. G4 is severe between 50 to 29, 2 if A1, 2 if A2, and 3 if A3. G5, which is kidney failure, which is EGFR less than 15. If it is A1, then four times a year, it will be monitoring. So it is almost every three months. More than or equal to four times, so even more frequently in this regard, and more than or equal to four times if it is, uh, again, uh, G5 plus A3. Now, in the previous exams, it has been asked for G3B. Uh, so we can definitely exam uh, expect some more questions in the coming exam. Again, these are the guidelines from the uh, Association of British Clinical Diabetologists and Renal Association UK have published guidelines and glycemic targets specific to the type of diabetes and the stage of CKD. Again, this has been asked previously in the exams and we can definitely expect some questions. A glycemic target specific to types of diabetes and stage of CKD. Type 1 diabetes, if it is stage 1 and 2, so stages we have already looked at here, 48 to 58 millimole per mole, which is 6.5 to 7.5%. As the Stage advances further, our targets become a little bit more relaxed. 3 and 4 is 7.5 to 7.8 percent. Stage 5 uh, on dialysis is 7.5 to 8.4 percent. This is in context of type 1. What about type 2? Stage 1 and 2, 6.5 to 7.5 percent. So that remains same for type 1 and type 2. Stage 3 and 4, already things start to change here, 6.9 to 7.5 percent. So if you look at a type 2 diabetic and a type 1 diabetic for that matter, a uh, little bit the type 1 diabetic is more relaxed. So 7.5 to 7.8 percent, whereas it is 6.9 to 7.5 percent for stage 3 and 4. And this is specific in terms of non hypo inducing agents. Otherwise, if the patient is on a hypo inducing agent like an SU or insulin for that matter, then the target is 7 to 7.9 percent, which is a little bit more relaxed. 
CKD stage 4 on hypoinducing agents and 5 on dialysis. This is 7.5 to 8 per 2 percent in context of a glycemic target for type 2 diabetic with CKD stage 4 and 5. So that's the end of my preview. So the free view of this particular lecture has ended. Uh, for access to this full lecture session, please subscribe to my lecture series, which is total of 60 lectures till date. Uh, these uh, will be provided access to via paid subscription plan. And uh, all the paid subscribers will be given a lifetime access to all my existing 60 videos lectures, which are already on the YouTube channel, plus all the upcoming new videos. So whatever lectures or sessions I'll be doing in coming weeks, months, and years, all of them will be uh, given access to in the same subscription plan. So for the full subscription details, please email me on mazirules at gmail.com or WhatsApp me on 0097155743479 and have the same number on the Telegram app as well. Uh, just to give a brief overview of the full lecture series, so it includes uh, different topics across diabetes and endocrinology. For diabetes itself is there are around 19 lectures which I've done across different topics which are useful for the exams as well as for the clinical endocrinology practice. In terms of uh, high yield topics for specialty exam and European board exam, there are around nine sessions which have covered all the previous exam recalls as well as all the high yield topics and themes which are frequently encountered in the uh, specialty exams and the European board exams. In terms of thyroid, apart from the thyroid cancer guidelines, which were recently uh, published, plus there are other sessions on different topics uh, related to thyroid uh, across the spectrum of thyroid disease. In terms of adrenal as well, covering all the important topics or sessions which are frequently encountered in exams and in clinical practice. There are two very good sessions on lab endocrinology by Dr. Well Murugan. Very helpful for those preparing for uh, DM endo or DNB endocrinology as well. In terms of pituitary also, I have covered all the important sessions on all the important topics which are frequently encountered in clinical practice and the exams. There are a few sessions on the inherited endocrine syndromes as well. Very important sessions on reproductive endocrinology about uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, gynecomastia, hirsutism, PCOS, diagnosis, evaluation, management. There is a uh, sessions on calcium and bone metabolism, on familial lipid disorders, and uh, sessions on pediatric endocrinology as well. So just to let you know that there are many more sessions coming up. And as I mentioned, that in the same subscription plan or same subscription fee, you will be provided access to all my existing 60 lectures plus all my forthcoming lectures. So thank you very much for subscribing. Thank you very much for supporting.